I'll tell you, there's no way I could have imagined that things would be converging as quickly as they are. I thought they were going quickly about six months ago. And before that, I thought they were going quickly about a year ago and so on and so forth. And now they're just beyond light speed. We've moved into hyperspeed, hyperdimensional speed in the way things are converging. The question is, when you look at what's taking place, right now we have the creation of central bank digital currencies. I just saw one today where the International Monetary Fund, which is of the double, of course, and it is, is coming up with a one world or a global central bank digital currency. Of course, through them, in control. You have the BRICS nation conglomerate, can I say it that way, meeting in August, in which they will most likely increase their number from five to 10. And those nations are already named. And basically what you're doing is covering a good portion of the planet. Could that be the substance of the 10 kings that rise up? So you have BRICS meeting. Then you have the United Nations meeting to formulate their final seven-year plan to complete their Agenda 2030. Could that be the seven-year peace plan? Many are talking about that. You have wars and rumors of wars, and now it's looking like Ukraine is blaming Russia for setting dirty bombs in the nuclear facility. I can't even name the name of the city. And Russia's doing the same, that Ukraine has set dirty bombs. And so they're just planning for a red flag event of releasing some sort of a nuclear holocaust in that region. And you have China rising up and taking control of a good portion of the West, including the East. And what you have now are are the convergence of different structures that the enemy has put together to control the world. And so at some point, they're going to clash. It's going to go kaboom, and the dust is going to settle, and a beast is going to rise. And that's where we are. And not to forget what is taking place in Israel as they are preparing. I, I think they're prepared. They're ready for this to begin at any moment, a multinational, multi-front war that I believe fulfills the Zechariah 12 prophecies of the surrounding nations. I'm not going to go back into why I believe uh, Psalm 83 is a precatory prayer that will be fulfilled in Zechariah chapter 12, but I did a video on that. You go look at that. That's not to, that's not to uh, disagree with anybody who believes in a Psalm 83 war. I just believe there's a prophetic word, prophetic prayer, a precatory prayer, uh, pardon me, imprecatory prayer, which is uh, a praying against these enemies that will be fulfilled by God, and it's in Zechariah chapter 12. That starts the whole ball, ball of wax rolling, and you are talking about the end coming so very quickly. And there, then there are the, the confirmation of dates that 2030 seems to be like the, the year that everything converges in the war, in the war of all wars, and we're seven years in front of that. So are we entering the highest watch time ever? That's the question. I want to show you what I have found. We're going to talk about what others have found, and we're going to look at this through the eyes of Scripture and see if we are right now at the door of the highest watch time ever. Thank you for joining me. I am Jimmy. This is Last Day's Awakening. You are tuning into a study today of could we be nearing the highest watch time ever? For those who are faithful listeners of this channel, I missed last week. We are in the middle. This is this is what's crazy about all of this, or seems crazy. We are in the middle of of transitioning our congregation from one leased location to another. We don't own a building. We are moving to another location that will better serve us, larger, more uh, visibility. In fact, greatest visibility, I think, in the city that the Lord has opened the door to. I mean, just in front of us, out of the blue, boom, 
after years of praying that God would open the door, he's done it. So I've been in the middle of preparing that facility. Uh, me and a, and a handful of other guys have been working, uh, not only guys, ladies too, to get us into that building. And some would say, well, if you think the time is so short, why are you doing this? Because we are not called to stop doing what we're supposed to be doing and following the guidance of the Holy Spirit just because we believe that we are about to enter the highest watch time ever. We're called to occupy until he comes, continue to do what we can and, and go through the open doors. See, the Lord said that to the uh, the church of Philadelphia. Behold, I've opened a door and no one will be able to shut it. Isn't that amazing that we have open doors? And I think we'll have open doors until the rapture takes place trumpet sounds okay so we're going to work until he comes but it's amazing to me that the, the the prospect of what's taking place in our congregation has excited people into greater praying and ministry and all kinds of things because we want to be in the center of god's will and what he wants to do in our community now let me let me pause this phone i should have i should have taken the sound off that before i even started but you know things happen I'm excited about what the Lord is doing and what I'm seeing, what I'm learning. And let me preface everything that I'm about to begin with, with, with these thoughts about six years ago. And I've been studying prophecy ever since I was 12 years old. And I'm 64 now. Uh, I know I don't look that old. It's, uh, it's good coffee that has kept me going, right? I digress. 12 years old. So what's that put it? 52 years I've been studying prophecy. I've been preaching on prophecy and teaching prophecy and what I've learned in prophecy since I was 12 years old. I did my first prophecy teaching in a tent one night with a bunch of friends as we were cap camping out uh, in the backyard of, of one of my friends. And in the middle of the night, we got to talking about prophecy. These guys weren't Christians. And so I got to share with them some of the prophetic word, at least to, to the minimal understanding that I has had as a 12 years old, as a 12 year old, I need to slow my talking down to catch up with my brain. <laughs> but um, I've been teaching it ever since and all my pastoral ministry and all my uh, ministry, my wife and I as missionaries to South in South America, to Columbia, South America, in uh, planting churches and, and sharing with friends and, and witnessing it's all uh, wrapped up around this, these prophecies, the prophecies of Jesus coming the first time and the prophecies of Jesus coming the second, second time and the nearness that we find ourselves to the rapture, to the catching away, the harpazo, which is in the scripture, which is biblical, which is throughout scripture, et cetera, et cetera. So this isn't new to me, but there are new things that are coming out and, and we'll talk about those, but six years ago, I was walking through, uh, as I do, walking through full book, books of the Bible, and I was in Exodus, and I was with a pen and paper counting out the days that were given from the time that the Passover took place. The next day, Israel left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, spent three months in the desert going towards Sinai, arrived at Sinai on the 15th of the third month. All right. And so 15th of the third month has always always been celebrated right in that time of um, of what we called Pentecost. And the picture of Pentecost was that Moses went up and received the law. So there's kind of a an overlapping with Jewish tradition here. Moses went up, received the law, came down. And um, this was. Uh, this was a symbol of Pentecost that was to come. So we always celebrated Pentecost, of course. Pentecost being a, a word from the Latin, which is um, the, the Septuagint, you know, tr tr the translation in the Septuagint, then you had the Latin, and you, you got the Greek Pentecost. You got all these translations can be confusing, but we always use the word Pentecost to describe that first 49 or seven Sabbaths and the next day being what is known as 
in traditional view, Pentecost. Okay, but I was having trouble because part of the association with how we looked at Pentecost, air quotes here, was the Spirit of God was poured out on uh, the, those who were gathered in the upper room. Uh, you know, we always looked at it as a small upper room where they'd gathered for 10 days after Jesus ascended, and then the Spirit of God was poured out, and then thousands of people heard it. No, it's in the temple. It's where they were supposed to be in the temple, and that's what that conclusion I came to. But before I confuse you too much, we looked at it as 3,000 people were baptized that day as a result of what had happened to the 120 as the Spirit of God was poured out. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit, began to speak in other languages. They all recognized the language. Of course, some said, they're drunk, they're drunk on new wine. Peter says, nope, it's only nine in the morning. It's too early to get drunk. That's how we always looked at it. And so we associated that 3,000 with the same 3,000 that died when Moses came down the mountain with the law. But we got a problem because if you go to Exodus, you got a day count. And I actually came up with 103 days from the time that that uh, Passover was celebrated and the second time, actually third time, maybe even fourth time that Moses went up and came down from the mountain was 103 days. He came with the tablets written front and back by the finger of God. Okay, Cecil B. DeMills is right there. And he comes down with the tablets of clay, and he's coming down because there is a ruckus in the camp, and and when he sees what is going on with the dancing, the partying, the drunkenness, and the lewdness before a golden calf, he throws the <laughs> tablets of stone down. The process is, of course, that he calls out who, those who are for the Lord or on the Lord's side come up and the Levites come up and um, Moses melts the calf, puts it in the water, makes everybody drink it. And it ends up 3000 people are killed. So the, the correlation between the tradition was that Pentecost on the day of Pentecost, God made up for the 3000 that died, that were slaughtered because of rejecting God and worshiping a golden calf. And now the church is born when the Spirit of God is poured out and 3,000 are saved, and that correlation was there. Problem is, numbers don't add up. The number count was wrong because that happened 103 days after Passover. And if you want to use the three days for first fruits, you can sure do it. Whatever the case is, there are two sets of 50. So you either have one or two Pentecosts. And then we come to find out from some temple documents and Dr. Barry Awe, many of you just kind of shoot him down immediately because he's he's got a he's got a zany sense of humor. I love it. I'm I'm I, my my whole right elbow is zany. I mean, goodness, I love it. Mr. Bones, the whole bit. Some don't because you have no sense of humor. You need to bang your elbow on something to get a little bit of a funny bone. <laughs> All right, but. You know, I've been watching what's been going on. I've been I've been following him for um, oh goodness, a couple of years now. And then Aaron on God a minute. Well, let me share screen. I want to send you to one of their videos that you can actually go and watch. And um, here it is. Uh, this is I think their most recent one they did together five days ago. It's called "The Year and the Season of the Rapture" with at Doctor Barry All five three seven two. So Aaron, this is on God a minute. With Aaron, it got a minute. I've listened to this, uh, watched it. I've watched all of uh, Dr. Barry's stuff for the la for the last I don't know how long, but um, go find that, listen to it. But what Dr. Barry Aw came out with and was really uh, smacked down by a lot of people. I mean, in some really rude and terrible ways that brothers in Christ shouldn't even be doing, was that the Lord is fulfilling. The prophecy to Daniel, when Daniel in chapter twelve of Daniel is saying, "When will these things happen?" and the Lord saying, "Daniel, shut the things of these, shut these things up in the book until the end." And it happens actually three times in that chapter, chapter twelve. There's three different ways the Lord says, "Shut these things up. You don't need to know. You're gonna die. You're gonna go home to be with your people. It's gonna be fine." All right, but one of those he says until the time of the end when people will go to and fro. And which is uh, the Hebrew word zit zit. Isn't that cool? Zit zit. You go to and fro and knowledge will increase. I think it's a kind of a dual prophecy that there will be 
people going anywhere. You can go anywhere, anytime. Uh, if you wear a mask in some places, but or if you're in some places, but still anywhere, anytime with the travel of the day uh, and knowledge will increase, which is exponentially increasing every 10 minutes. I think it's doubling now. It's, it's just ridiculous amount of knowledge. We can't contain it all. It's going to take artificial intelligence to interpret it all and put it all into place. And that's danger, Will Robinson. But the other way to interpret that is that they will go to and fro in the word of God, to and fro in the scriptures, to and fro, back and forth, and seeing how everything is connecting and knowledge of the scripture will increase, meaning that which has been hidden will be revealed. Some would say new revelation. I have trouble with anything new revelation. It's actually new understanding of the revelation that has always been in front of us, okay, because this is it. This is this this is it. This old worn out Bible. This is it. But we're learning, we're learning the things that were precept upon precept and line upon line that we we may have been missing some stuff and tradition was locking us in. And I'm from a fellowship. We call ourselves a fellowship, a denomination that is um, that believes that the gifts of the Holy Spirit and and the phenomena penny, uh, phenomenon of Pentecost, if we want to call it Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, is for today. And so we are a Pentecostal denomination, but yet we were stuck in the 50-day period that we're seeing, I'm saying I've been seeing for six years is inaccurate in where that celebration of what Pentecost is or the day of Pentecost fully coming into being or being fulfilled was all right so i have somebody call me i'm not going to take it it's it's a buddy but he can wait so what do we do with all of that do we just buck tradition yeah well that's okay too but when dr barry brought all of this out it just it just popped because from my studies of that 103 days missing I, I couldn't come up with the answer first of all I didn't have the resources in front of me to go find some things and plus I'm a pastor and so I'm busy doing other things and at that time we were walking through that five and a half year period uh, of uh, the suffering of our daughter living in our home while we're trying to plant a church and she has ALS and she is uh, on her way to death. And then three years ago she passed and we've gone through all of that time. And suddenly you begin to get some new understanding. And Dr. Berry got some new understanding that lines up perfectly with what was eating at my spirit and my study of the word six years ago. And so we're going to talk about that. So it is, it is fascinating to see some things. I'm going to go back to share screen here. So bear with me as I click on to what has been taking place. When, and I'll get to it in just a moment, when Dr. Barry began to show from the temple scrolls, the temple documents that were found and have been poured over since 19, was it 1948 that those documents were found? The caves of Qumran. And it's taken a while to pour through this fragments and, and everything, but one of those documents, which we'll, we'll see in just a moment, talks about something the scripture alludes to, and that is that there is the feast of Shavuot. Shavuot is that 50-day period after first fruits in which the Feast of Weeks, it's not called Pentecost, we have interpreted into Pentecost, but it is the Feast of Weeks. It's called Shavuot, in which 50 days after first fruits, the priest would offer the first fruits of the wheat. So the first first fruits is of barley. Jesus rose from the dead on first fruits. In fact, let me, let, let me go down to a little chart here I have prepared. Don't worry about a lot of this. Just Let's just walk our way through it. Abib or Nisan. Nisan's the Babylonian, uh, Babylonian term for Abib. Abib means greening of the barley. 
Abib one was to be the first of the year. That's actual Rosh Hashanah. And I still hear people using Rosh Hashanah for Tishri one. That is the disobedient Jews using that. And yet many Christians have bought into that. That's Rosh Hashanah. No, it's not. Numbers chapter 12. The Lord changed that. It's clear. Uh, pardon me. Exodus chapter 12. That it's clear that the Lord says, from now on, Abib 1, which is called Nisan 1, will be Rosh Hashanah. Then comes the 10th, and that was the day of the choosing of the lamb. Then four days later, the slaughter of the lamb is the Passover. So there's a four-day period of examining the lamb that you brought into your home to make sure that it was without blemish so it could be... Uh, it could be slaughtered, the blood collected, and painted on the doorposts and the lintel of your home, and the death angel passed over. That's to be a perpetual celebration throughout all of eternity, never to end. So you had the Passover. The next day after the Passover is the beginning. That's the 15th of Abib or Nisan was the beginning of unleavened bread, and for seven days, that high Sabbath all the way through. So it's going to be a high Sabbath. If it doesn't land on the normal Sabbath, it's certainly going to cross over the first Sabbath all the way to the second Sabbath. It's a seven-day feast that has high Sabbath at the beginning and high Sabbath at the end. And that was a time when they were not to have any leaven even in their home. So it's the picture of the removal of leaven or removal of sin. Jesus is buried at even time at the beginning of unleavened bread, and he is there for three days. So there is a, a crossover. There's a little bit of a discrepancy as far as how people interpret that. I'm not even going to worry about that right now. We do know that after the, after the Sabbath, after unleavened bread, Jesus is raised from the dead, and that is first fruits of the barley. When Jesus rises from the dead, this is very quick. This is review. When Jesus rises from the dead, the women are at the tomb, and Jesus appears. And Jesus appears and talks with Mary. He says to Mary, she's saying, who are you? Where have you put him? He says, because she thinks he's the gardener. He says, Mary. When he says that, her eyes are open. She realizes it's her Lord, and, and she wants to grab him. He says, no, don't touch me because I have not yet ascended to my father. He is going to ascend that day and present the offering of the first fruits of the barley. So there's going to be a completion of the barley harvest. He is offering the first fruits, which he must do for there to be a harvest that's acceptable to the Lord. The first fruits have to be offered. He offers the first fruits of the barley, and then he comes back and he is with them for a period of 50 days. It actually counts out to 50 days. He's with them 40 days at one time. But before that, the first day, he appears to, to uh, the guys on the road to Emmaus. Then later on, he appears to the group of disciples. Then he appears to Thomas. And then he appears to Peter and the, and the group in Galilee. And then 40 days. That actually adds up to 50, which corresponds to the 50 days to Shavuot. And then he ascends. We've always always celebrated the Ascension Day 10 days before, so I would encourage you to go watch Dr. Barry's videos, and he'll explain all of that. I don't have time to do it, and he does a much better job than I could anyway. But Shavuot is the first fruits of the wheat, and so the first fruits offering of the wheat have to be presented. Jesus becomes the first fruits of the resurrection of the wheat, the harvest of the wheat and the resurrection to come when he ascends to heaven presents that offering and there he is at the right hand of the father he is he is um he's with the father all right that that was our problem that was our difficulty but then but dr barry began to point out from the temple scrolls the temple documents that there's another 50 day period between shavuot and what was known as the feast of new wine and that takes place Roughly on of eight, um, however, we're going to read in the temple scrolls, temple documents, they actually believe of three. 
Okay, so now we're talking about a period of time between of three and not only of eight or nine. And of course, of nine is a an historic day for the Jews because that was when the bad report was given by 10 of the 12 who had gone into the promised land to spy it out. And that brought the 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 judgment of God, a 40-year period of time, two had already been served, but still 38 years that would be served in which all of them that gave the bad report and all of Israel that chose the bad report would die in the desert. Also on that day, both temples, the first Solomon's temple and the later temple of Herod were destroyed on Av 9, and so many bad things have happened on Av 9, which is the day after the Feast of New Wine. The Feast of New Wine was the day in which Moses came off the mountain with the inscribed tablets of stone, and they were having their Feast of New Wine. If you look at the story, Aaron says, prepare yourself for tomorrow is a feast day. So there's, it's already set as part of what they're doing, the Feast of New Wine. And they made the golden calf and they're they're getting drunk on new wine and they're dancing and they're doing all these things. And boom, next day of nine, 3,000 die. Once again, go watch those videos of Dr. Barry Awe. They're not far-fetched. They're not false prophet material. It is scriptural. Bang, boom, bada bing, bada boom, right in line. I'm I'm fully on board. And then, of course, that is the mystery feast. It is mentioned in Scripture, which we will see in just a moment, but it's not part of the seven. That means it is part of a mystery. And just as the church is a mystery in the Old Testament, although it is hinted at and sometimes strongly hinted at, a nation of a foolish nation, uh, plural, by the way, which means Gentiles, that God would choose them and he would bless them. Uh, that's that's part of the Old Testament. All the nations on the earth would be blessed by Messiah through Abraham, and so on and so forth. So it's a mystery that is revealed, and we know it's been revealed because Peter stood up and revealed it on the day of Pentecost, when they were accusing them of being drunk on new wine. And we'll touch that just a little bit, too. But the fall feasts come into play because you have on Tishri 1, which the Jews call Rosh Hashanah, that the Lord changed back to the first, is the day known as Yom, I got uh, Yom, forgot the name here, Teruah. Oh, no wonder. No wonder. There it is. Yom Teruah, Feast of Trumpets. Ten days later, and that's a two-day feast, so... But on the 10th, so the two-day feast actually gives eight days later, but on the 10th of Tishri is Yom Kippur, in which the two goats are presented, one for bloodletting, the other for having the sins of Israel conferred on his head and then taken out into the desert. And we know that is a day of judgment, but it's also a day of salvation. And then you have five days later, the beginning of a seven-day feast up to eighth day, Shemini Atzeret, being the Feast of Tabernacles known as Sukkot. Now, you've got all of that. I know that was quick. We've talked about this a lot. If you're new to the channel, there's a lot of videos that you can go look at. But that is the, that is the schedule of feasts. The problem was we, was we were celebrating the pouring out of the Holy Spirit on the the day of Shavuot, when it's actually 50 days later. And that's your 103-day count that I was having such difficulty with that has come out in the wash. Yes, it's come out, and the Lord has given us new understanding. Now, all of that in the background. I wanted to, within my congregation on Sundays, go into a series talking about the importance of the bread and the wine. When you look at uh, how we celebrate what we call communion. I do not believe in the Eucharist because the Eucharist has this whole picture of the bread turning into the flesh of Christ and the body uh, being crucified again and the blood, blood, the wine being the blood and the 
blood being shed again. And each time you perform the mass and, and take the Eucharist, it's the sacrifice of Christ for you. Hebrews tells us in chapter 10 that Christ died once and for all. His blood was shed one time for all. It happened one time, so we don't do it over and over. But what I'm doing with my congregation is pointing out how the bread and the wine are important, first of all, for the marriage covenant, for the engagement all the way up to the time of marriage, and how bread and wine play into the feasts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so I did my first sermon. We'll not talk about it. But then this last week, I went to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and the Lord showed me something. Um, through his spirit, I don't hear the audible voice of the Lord. I hear, you know, a nudge in my spirit that something is important here. So I want to read this to you. This is uh, the story after Samuel had disobeyed, pardon me, Saul had disobeyed the Lord when he was supposed to go to the Amalekites and destroy them, men, women, children, and all of the animals. They were a Nephilim tribe that had persecuted Israel on the east side of the Jordan as they were coming to the promised land, and the Lord is finally going to bring punishment to them. Saul disobeys because he keeps King Agag alive, and they have taken the best of the spoils to themselves, the herds, etc., etc., etc. And so Samuel comes to Saul, and he he questions him, goes through the little trial there, and, and then he declares to Saul that God has taken away the throne from him. Then the story of Samuel going to the home of Jesse, and um, the Lord is going to anoint a new king, and it ends up to be the last son of Jesse, David, who is the shepherd. Then comes this portion of scripture. So let's read it together. Let's get myself, can I get myself any more out of the way for you? It says, but the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and a distressing spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said to him, surely a distressing spirit from God is troubling you. Let our master now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp, and it shall be that he will play it with his hand when the distressing spirit from God is upon you, and you shall be well. Okay, pretty good plan. So Saul said to his servants, provide me now a man who can play well and bring him to me. Then one of the servants answered, oh, look, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a handsome person. So there's obviously a period of time when between Samuel anointing David, this ruddy kid, and, and now David has grown a little bit. We know from his own story that he has fought the lion, he's fought the bear to preserve his sheep. And so he's, he's obviously growing, but he's also growing in his... Um, uh, playing of the harp and his singing of psalms. And so he's got, there's a, there's a reputation there. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, send me your son, David, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread, a skin of wine, and a young goat and sent them by his son, David to Saul. Real quickly here, there's some names mentioned that mean something. Jesse, the name Jesse means possessor or the owner, and it's kind of a picture of God being the, uh, the creator of heaven and earth, and he owns everything. He is the owner. He's the possessor. David means beloved, and beloved of God is a picture, of course, of Jesus, who is going to come from the line of David to fulfill the covenant with David and also the covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob through Judah all the way to David. And so Jesus is going to come through David. He's the son of David, the son of man, and he's the beloved of God. And David is beloved of God. So you almost have right here, you do have, I said almost, but you do have a picture of 
the creator of heaven and earth, the possessor of everything, and, and the one who is going to bring the gift as being the beloved of God. To Saul, who is in distress, who is a sinner, who has failed, who has failed miserably. And so the typology is pretty incredible right here. So what is it that David is going to bring by the hand of David, provided by father, the possessor, are a donkey. Loaded with bread, wine, and a young goat. And he sent them by his son, the beloved, to Saul. So David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So Saul loved him greatly, and David became his armor bearer. That's how that's interpreted, of course. Then Saul sent to Jesse, saying, please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. And so as I'm, I'm preparing this sermon I, sermon, I begin to see these highlighted words and study these highlighted words, which is my custom to study out everything that I possibly can in a verse and squeeze out all the stuff that's in there and then apply it. Now we're applying it to the bread and the wine because right here, bread and wine appear. You follow me? So how does this relate? Well, once again, the typology is the father sends the son and the son in his hand are the bread and the wine of a bread and wine of a covenant. Take this bread. He distributed it. He broke it, distributed, it, said, this is my body broken for you. Then the wine, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for you. Take it and drink it. And then the marriage comes in because Jesus on the last cup, there are four cups, does not take the fourth cup, the cup of consummation. He says, I'm not going to take this cup until I drink it again with you in my father's kingdom house, if you want to say it that way. It's the marriage, the final cup of consummation that will be uh, received by Jesus and the bride together. And that, of course, is the church, the, the true church of believers that will be with him for the seven day slash seven year period of time and take together at the end of that seven, the consummation cup. So it means the marriage has been consummated. Now we take the wine and it's called, it's called the marriage supper of the lamb in the book of the revelation. So it's all right there. Then it got a little bit deeper because I began to see donkey, bread, wine, and goat. And immediately I went back to my, my brain's timeline of the seven feasts. And now we've got the feast, the mystery feast of new wine that is there. And here's what I saw. So you see them highlighted, right? When we were looking at this before, you're thinking, why has he got those things highlighted? Why are those things highlighted? Jesus came riding in on the day of the choosing. Okay, the day of the choosing is not a feast, but the day of the choosing is very important because on the 10th of Abib slash Nisan, Jesus came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, actually on the mother and the colt. So he's riding on two donkeys, but the thing here is he's riding on a donkey, he came riding on a donkey. Okay, so you have the whole beginning of the choosing of the lamb all the way to the slaughter of the lamb all the way through to unleavened bread as being pictured as Jesus coming in and then being rejected by his people, which was going to bring all sorts of curses all the way up to Ab 9 in the year A.D. 70 because they rejected him, but he came riding on a donkey. Oh my goodness, there's a picture. There's a picture of, of typology here in this story with Saul that goes all the way to us. Okay, let's take that part. Oh, and then the bread. The bread has two significant pictures here. I, I believe you can look at it two ways. First of all, Jesus said, he is the bread. His body is the bread. He is the manna from heaven. He is the bread. And so his body is broken on Passover. His body is broken, unleavened bread, broken. So the perfect son of God is broken to restore the relationship that was broken in the Garden of Eden 
when Adam broke fellowship with God, Jesus restores it by the perfect bread, the unleavened bread, no sin, broken for us. And now you have that picture of the bread on the donkey, but the scripture in 1 Samuel doesn't say unleavened bread. It says bread when it's not specifically mentioned as unleavened bread, it's leavened bread. And leaven is a picture on the one hand of sin, but it's on the other hand, it's a picture of the kingdom of God, the leaven of God, the, the spirit of God, the, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that leavens us with the kingdom of God. We're citizens of the kingdom of God because of the bread. Well, Shavuot, Leviticus chapter 23 gives the specifications on Shavuot, the first fruits of the wheat, that the priests were to gather the sheaves in a certain amount, and they were to bring that, crush it up, add leaven to it and water, and it would leaven. Now, I, I love baking bread, okay? I haven't done it for quite a while because it it fills me up, and I just don't want to swell up like that. But they lift two loaves. They are to lift two loaves as offerings for the first fruits of the wheat. You can't see me do this. They've got two loaves in the air, and they're they're waving them to the Lord. And we look at that as being a symbol of the Jews and the Gentiles in the kingdom of God. So there is no Jew, and there is no Greek with a dividing wall between them. They're both part of the body of Christ. It started with the Jews. It has gone through history with the Gentiles and a few Jews, and now there are many more Jews coming to Christ in these last days. You have two loaves being lifted as one before the Lord as the offering of the first fruits, and it's the day the bread that was broken, now two pieces, perfect. The bread is as a first fruit lifted up into heaven. It fits exactly with the ascension of Jesus Christ. It's tradition has it 10 days before that. Jesus came to fulfill everything that Moses did and everything in the law exactly. So there are no 10 day off here. Shavuot is Ascension Day. I'm absolutely convinced of it. I think tradition is wrong. I think it's wrong and it's been proven wrong in so many ways. I don't want to rock anybody's boat. I don't think the Lord's offended at whenever you celebrate the fact that he rose again from the dead. And I don't think he's necessarily offended when we celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, because that should be something we celebrate every day with new wine coming into a new everyday wine skin. Okay, so I, I don't want you to be bent out of shape, but there's a picture of the bread. You've got it in two directions. You've got it over here and you've got it at Shavuot. The bread rises. Then comes something incredible. I'm going to take you now. Let me uh, let me share screen in a different. See if I can do it this way. No, I can't. Let me stop sharing this one for just a moment, and then go to another. Now here's the the very all, but I want to take you to the temple documents. This is the. It's called the Three Shavuot Festivals. Shavuot means weeks, of course. We're talking about seven, seven weeks. So three sets of sevens, and it's always like the day after the seven is the special day. So 50, 50, 50. The Three Shavuot Festivals of Qumran, wheat, wine, and oil. So here's the document that Dr. Barry is talking about. We're going to go by Bikurim. Uh, and reading all of that, we have uh, Bikurim only for wheat. No, they say that that first fruits isn't just for the wheat. It's not just for the barley. Uh, it's for all three seasons and harvests. And then we have our festival calendar, wheat festival. Don't be confused. I know I'm scrolling quickly, but I, here is the wine festival. It says, whereas Leviticus 23 moves next to discuss the festival on the first of the seventh month, what eventually became known in the Jewish calendar as Rosh Hashanah, 
The temple scroll continues with its second set of 50, this time from Shavuot until the next holiday, which is the wine festival. Here's what it says, and you should count off for yourselves from the day of which you carried to Yahweh the new cereal offering, the bread of the first fruits, seven weeks. There will be seven full weeks up to the day after the seventh Sabbath. You will count off 50 days, and you shall of it or offer, pardon me, new wine for libation. The reason is the barley is ready to be first fruited. I know that's probably not a word, but it sounds good right now. First fruits of the barley bring in over a 50-day period of time the barley harvest. When that's complete, the first of the wheat is ready to be offered as a first fruits. That's Shavuot. So the first of the wheat, the resurrection, the first uh, fruit of the resurrection started at the barley. And Jesus fulfilled that, offered the first fruits. And then he's going to offer the first fruits of the wheat by ascending to heaven. And he's there now as the wheat harvest continues. But then 50 days later is going to be the first fruit of the of the grapevine, because that's when the grapes are coming. Now, I'm growing grapes right up. On, you can't see it, of course, but I'm pointing that way in my little one acre. It's a long acre. It's only a city lot, normal lot size wide, but it's long all the way to an acre. And back there, I have my garden. And three years ago, when we first moved into this place, I planted several arbors of grapes, different types of grapes. I wasn't supposed to get grapes until the fifth year. You're to prune and you're really not going to get a harvest until the fifth year. But guess what? This is the third year and I've got clusters of grapes. I've got clusters of grapes. It's amazing. I don't know. Can I do this? I'm going to do it anyway. Bear with me. I took I took a picture of my cluster of grapes. Let me stop share. I'm going to try to get this so you can see it. Can you, I don't know if you can see it. Look at that. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. Look at that right there. Nice big green grapes. And um, and I'm watching them because um, <laughs> because I I want to I I'm starting to think the feast of new wine. There's no way I'm going to make wine. I don't have enough grapes. And I don't know. I don't know what I'm doing, and what would be the point. But I could crush those up and have grape juice when they're ripe, and they're about oh, three weeks from being ripe. Oh my goodness! Oh my goodness! And here it is. We're about. Uh, we're going to be approaching right now 40, 46 weeks. Pardon me. Uh, forty six days since Shavuot. So. Uh, what's that? Six, seven, seven weeks, about uh, uh, five weeks, five and a half weeks since Shavuot to the time of the new wine. And now let's, I, I digress there. I hope you are patient. In this passage, the temple scroll flattens another difference between Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and this time one of phraseology. Leviticus rever refers to the seven weeks as literal seven Sabbaths. Deuteronomy calls them seven weeks, just as it does with the double name of Shavuot in the previous passage. Okay. So, so it's the 50th day after first fruits comes Shavuot, and then 50 days later comes the feast of the new wine festival now you can go read this i'll leave the link in um below what they have done they have come out to the completion of the second 50 at av three all right av or of the third of av dr barry comes out to the eighth of av why the discrepancy of the five days? The reason is in the Qumran community, they are counting from Passover and not counting from 
the day after the uh, the first Sabbath or the first Sabbath after the first fruits. And there's a there's obviously in that year a five day discrepancy. So they're counting wrongly. But what I'm going to do here is uh, once again share screen with my timeline. And here's what it's going to look like on the timeline. Of three would land roughly about right here where my arrow is, where my mouse is landing. All right. And five days later is of nine. The Qumran community is witnessing to the fact that there is a feast of wine, new wine. We are confirming the fact by another witness that on the day that that 50 fully came after Jesus told them to tarry in Jerusalem, which Barry brought this out. And it's beautiful. He says, why? Because Shavuot is the second of the three feasts in which all of the men of Jerusalem were to, or Israel, were to be in Jerusalem. They were to be there. It was demanded of them in the law. So Jesus wouldn't have told them, oh, stay there, guys, don't leave. No, they would not have left on Shavuot because it was a it was the law. It's the day Jesus rose from uh into heaven from the, the Mount of Ascension. Uh not going to get into all of that because there's debate, but they would have been there. But now comes a 50-day test. I love the way Dr. Barry brought this out. And on Av 8, when it is full 50, then that is the day of the new wine. And what did they accuse the disciples of? The 120, when they heard them speaking in tongues, they're probably in the upper floor of Solomon's temple, which is an open air um, in, the, uh, in the courts of Solomon, so, uh, not Solomon's temple, Herod's temple. And uh, the plaza laid out before them is filled with with pilgrims probably left over themselves waiting for their trip back home whatever the case they hear them in their own language and they're amazed at what they're hearing the glories of god they're hearing the gospel it's just wonderful but some say they're drunk on new wine those guys are drunk on new wine why would they say that because it's the time of the new wine the time of the new wine it's impossible to have new wine at shavuot by then, new wine has been the, the new wine was harvested in the previous uh, summertime, end of summer, and it's in a wine skin, and it has been swelling in that old wine skin. It's no longer new wine, guys, gals. It's impossible for there to be new wine on Shavuot. They're not to be drinking wine from Passover. After that Passover wine, by the way, they're not to be drinking wine until the new wine. And it says it right there in the Qumran in scrolls. They're not to drink wine until new wine. New wine can only happen at the harvest of the grapes, at the, at the first fruits of the grape harvest, which is going to take place over the next few weeks from the first fruits called new wine. And they take that first fruits, they crush the grapes, uh, and, and they do it and pour it out on the altar. And the first one who drinks, of course, is the high priest. He has to drink first. And no one can drink wine until after the high priest has poured it out and then drank the wine himself. They can't be drunk. Peter stands up and said, it's only the third hour, nine in the morning. And that's when the offering took place. That's according to what we just saw. And you can read it yourself. I'll leave that link from the Qumran community and the temple feasts, right? Their set of feasts. It all plays together to Av 8. Av 9's the bad day. So something has to happen on Av 8 that is involved with the first fruits of the new wine. The first fruits of the new wine was the wine poured out upon this 120, if that was the number, we'll, we'll just say it, 120. The 120 are there. They're receiving the new wine. The wine is going to be harvested up until the end of the new wine harvest right? And we look at uh, day 
being repeated over and over again. Shavuot being repeated over and over. Shavuot was when Moses went up on the mountain after the Lord said, come up here, and Jesus is caught up. Ascension, not harpazo, but he ascends on that day. And then comes the mystery of the outpouring of the Spirit of God, Joel chapter 2, which Peter quotes. This is what was prophesied by Joel. In the last days, I'll pour out of my spirit on all flesh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And he he keeps that in place all the way up till the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay, so something has to be fulfilled, and it was fulfilled on new wine. And since that's first fruit, could it be that new wine is the time in which the church is completed and taken up the times of the Gentiles fully comes, Romans chapter 11. All of that comes into play in that mystery feast, which in these last days, obviously to me, is no longer a mystery. 3,000 people died here, uh, pardon me, here on Ob 9. After the worship of the golden calf, 3,000 are saved on Pentecost, and, uh, and, and then we have something beautiful. But remember, there's also the goat, a young goat that David brought to Saul. What does that goat signify? Well, goat lands on Yom Kippur because the goat is the scapegoat. But because the goat, the scapegoat by Israel, was never received, okay? They did the ritual of the scapegoat, but when Jesus came and had the sins of the world conferred on his head, when the priests and the scribes beat on his head in front of the high priest, they were conferring. That's the ritual of laying hands on that head and conferring all the sins of Israel upon that goat. They would take that goat and they would walk it out into the desert and walk it off a cliff. That goat would die for the sins of Israel. The other goat would have its throat slit, pardon me, uh, if you're grossed out, but this is blood. Without the remission, shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. So it's a, a picture from Passover to Yom Kippur of shedding of blood. In other words, it's a completeness that comes by the blood of Jesus Christ, if you will stand on it, rely on it, and be covered by it. The propitiation, the covering, the lid is put on us. Father sees the blood of Christ and passes over. And so Yom Kippur is the day of judgment. We know that. Yom Kippur is, is the day in which uh, the day of atonement. We know this from Scripture is the day in which I believe the tribulation will begin and end. In a, in a Shemitah year, and could this be a Shemitah year? We're, we're kind of mixed up on when Shemitah years happen. But if we're still in a Shemitah year, um, the Shemitah year is combined with Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, as one long feast. And this comes into play at the beginning of the tribulation and certainly the return of the Lord, the second coming of Christ, when he returns on the Day of Atonement and atones for Israel. And so you have you have the completeness of the covenant with Abraham happening on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, or Kippur, it doesn't matter how you say it. And so you have donkey, bread, wine, and goat, a picture of the son of David bringing these three things to a lost Israel, Saul being lost. Now he's bringing this picture to Israel, and it will be clear to them after they have suffered a, a horrible time during the time of Jacob's trouble and call out to the Lord, Zechariah chapter 12 through 14, cry out to the Lord and say, Baruch habav Hashem Adonai, and, and be calling for for him to come. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They'll recognize him who they pierced as their Messiah, and he will come and rescue them on the day of atonement. Now I got to take a deep breath because I just gave it to you. Two more things. Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 39. Listen to this. For the children of Israel and the children of Levi shall bring the offering of the grain of the new wine, 
and the oil. Okay, 50 days after new wine comes Yom Kippur, the offering of the oil. Right there, Nehemiah. The grain, the wheat, the new wine, of eight, and the oil. Tishri 10, Yom Kippur. To the storerooms where the articles of the sanctuary are, where the priests who minister and the gatekeepers and the singers are, and we will not neglect the house of the Lord. Wow. Isaiah chapter 25, verse 6, and in this mountain, that's Zion, by the way, that's that's uh, Mount Moriah, that's, that's incredible. In this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of choice pieces, a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of well-refined wines on the leaves. What you're looking at is a feast. You're looking at a meal. <laughs> For all peoples. The, the consummation of it all is, is this feast of the Lord, which will be a perpetual feast, a forever feast, a banqueting table of the Lord. The millennial kingdom is has been completed, and then comes this Beautiful picture of eternity when we will forever fellowship and there will be bread, there will be new wine, there will be oil. There, will All of these will be there. Uh, confirms the wine. It confirms the wine. The feast of new wine. So, let me get out of my share screen, get my mug back up in here in uh, typology, of course. Listen, are we entering the highest watch time ever? If we are, it would be from now. I know there are, there's the picture of imminency, um, that the rapture is imminent. Okay, I'll buy that. I have been all my life. I've, I've bought it in that only the Lord knows when that day will be. But I'm also buying into the fact that the Lord has given us way too many clues and he has fulfilled scripture to the letter all the way through, and then it will be fulfilled to the letter all the way through from here on out. And so, highest watch time ever? If you're with the community of Qumran and how they count, we would be starting roughly in the neighborhood of July 21st. If you are counting uh, the 50s, the first set of 50, then the second set of 50, from after first fruits, then we're looking at July 26th into 27th as of eight, and then comes July 9th, which would be 27th into 28th. You could actually go 25th into 26th, 26th into 27th. We still don't know that two day period of time. All right. No man knows the day or the hour because it's a two day period of time because of the one day difference around the world. If nothing else, it's almost into the second day. You can you can fit that in within a couple of minutes all the way around the world, 12-hour period of time. But we'll leave it at that. If this is the highest watch period, this watch period would start possibly off 3, July 21st, and go all the way up to the Day of Atonement. If it's this year. And you're saying, oh. Pastor Jimmy, here you go. You're setting dates. No, I'm not. I'm looking at him as a high watch time. What would I prefer? <laughs> Take me home, country road, to the place I belong. The house of father. Okay, I'm making up any words there on that song by John Denver, but wow, what would I rather be? I would rather be in the presence of Jesus Christ. I'm sick of this world. The only thing that keeps me going now is my family, my friends, my church congregation, and the fact that I still have a job to do, and I'm going to do it until Jesus calls us home, whether by death or by trumpet, uh, as uh, members who have not died and are alive and remain in the last generation. Either one, I'll take either one, but I would prefer to hear the trumpet and fly out of here and have a change that happens immediately in the twinkling of an eye and meet Jesus in the air along with all my loved ones who have raised from the dead and go to Father's house. 
That's what I prefer. High watch time is here. Could it be next year? I don't see how, but it could be. I don't know, but this scenario is going to play out, I believe, in an incredible way. And the signs are now. The convergence of signs are happening now. I know this has been a long video for me. I'm sorry, um, but there was a lot of information that had to be given to you. I hope you've enjoyed it. Take it to the Lord. Always study the scripture and take it to the Lord and let the Lord show you from the scripture itself. And um, and keep looking up. Keep trusting the Lord. We've got so many things. Oh, my goodness. Why am I? I turned my phone off and it goes on the other computer. The trials of this world. Look, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So hang in there. Keep doing what you're called to do. Keep praying for one another. Keep praying for lost loved ones. Keep praying for your neighbor. Keep sharing Jesus Christ. Keep doing acts of kindness to people in the name of Jesus. Keep giving a cup of cold water, as it were, to people. Be, be kind and be loving even in the face of incredible evil in front of us, let's be Jesus. We can do it. We can do it. And I know you can do it too. And the Lord is with us through his spirit and he will help us. God bless you all. I love you dearly. And maybe we'll see each other very soon in the sky.